place that brings science and natural health together. A place that opens the doors to an exciting Thank you for that uh, uh, service song, um, Craig. Yes. So. At this point in time. As you can see there, we came from the, um, uh, produced by ianbritton.co.uk, um, used by permission of the, of the information you see on the screen at the moment. And, uh, yeah, uh, the UK has been the source of a lot of wonderful godly music. Now, today's service, Living the Adventist Life. I decided to give the sermon this particular title because I'm going to give you not a lot of scriptural verses today, but more of a personal spiritual testimony. And that's the title I've actually given to my uh, 
talk, but living the Adventist life is also appropriate because I was born at the end of 1959 in Auckland, New Zealand. My father was a committed third generation Adventist and having a strong interest in things mechanical, along with a mission focus, decided to try and become a diesel fitter for mission boats that were getting around the Pacific back in those days. To further his aim, we came to Australia in 1961. He had intentions of uh, studying the ministry and getting out there and not only being a diesel fitter, but also preaching. But for various reasons, he never got to go into the Pacific or complete his studies. So Australia became home for us. Now, we jump a few years and to go to the time that I was about eight years old. And we went out for a holiday to Mirrawinnie Gardens. Some people may know of that place. It's an Adventist Aboriginal institution west of Kempsey. We spent about a week there and got to celebrate the Sabbath with the folks down on the, uh, on the grounds. Now, I recall that they held their program on the veranda of one of the buildings, and I think it must have been summer because, as I seem to recall, it was fairly warm at the time, and it was a fairly bright, sunny day. In the distance, there was a playground. Now, my parents were very conservative Sabbath-keeping in Sabbath keeping practices and uh, playgrounds were one place we didn't go. Well, I had a whole bunch of indigenous kids following me around, but that playground, we eventually wandered around and finally got it. I sat on a swing for a bit, you know, you can't be doing anything wrong. I'm not swinging, you know, everything's okay. And you know the rest, what really got me from then on was the way those kids went wild the way you would expect kids to go wild having a birthday party. You know, the Holy Spirit spoke to me at that time and he, he said to me, you did that. And from that day to this, I often wondered what would have been had I done things differently. <laughs> Maybe I could have left the playground alone one day a week given that there are six other days and thousands of other playgrounds to enjoy. But that didn't enter my mind at the time. With the standards I currently hold regarding the Sabbath, I often shiver with regret thinking about how I led them the wrong way that day. As I grew, I had this understanding that Everyone was an Adventist and it wasn't until I was about to start school that I began to come aware that there was such a thing as secular society. Now, I'm going to jump forward a little and then return to the storyline. As a teenager or youth, I would listen to some of the fantastic conversion testimonies of some of the Adventist converts and would envy them to some degree. I wished for a conversion experience of the kind they had. And it was only a few years ago, it was pointed out to me that my thinking was faulty for the following reason. Most of us grow up with parents. As we grow, the love of the family is there with us. And yet if we are asked if we love our parents, most of us will almost reflexively say, yes, I do love my parents. We grow in this love. And the same thing happens when we grow as children in the habit of worshiping God. We've been trained from childhood to love God. It is so natural to us that we don't even think about it. It's a bit like someone telling a fish that it is wet. Coming back to my childhood, my parents would have worship every day without fail. One of the things that dad would do would be to read a chapter out of Uncle Arthur's Bible stories every evening. We would go 
through the whole 10 volumes in about 18 months and then start from the beginning again. What this meant was that by the time I got to leave church school, and oh, by the way, he kept doing that right up into my mid-20s. And, and I think even um, further because um, the youngest, uh, um, my youngest brother, I think he's uh, about 11 or 12 years younger than myself. So he kept doing that. Uh, but what this all meant was that by the time I got to leave church school and go into government school at the age of 10, I had a pretty good idea what we believed with regard to creation. Amongst other things, this included an acceptance of the age of the earth being roughly 6,000 years old. And this is when I hit my first challenge. Up until then, I thought that creation was the only way in which our past had transpired. So it's quite a shock that I had to listen one day to a school teacher who was actually supervising us because our normal teacher couldn't be there. And she decided to read to us from an evolution book on dinosaurs and immediately I knew something was amiss. This book spoke of how there are such things as dinosaurs, which I'd never heard of before, and how they were on the earth tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago on this earth. By the time I left that reading session, I had identified a problem, a conflict with the Bible. Either the Bible was wrong, and if the Bible was wrong, well, why should I listen to anything else it had to say? Because I'd already learned that much about the Bible. If it was wrong in one area, it was going to be wrong in every area. The other alternative was that what this book had to say was wrong. If the Bible was wrong in one area, then surely it must be wrong in all. I had learned that much by then, but how was I going to prove the truth of the matter? As a 10 year old, this was impossible for me. The answer was not available to me. Now there was one thing I'd also learned by this time, what you believe and live by has consequences. What was the consequence of rejecting what the Bible has to say? For me, the consequence was the loss of eternal life if God existed and I rejected his existence. I could not see any consequences for rejecting the claims of evolution. It did not occur to me at the time that death was the only thing on offer from evolution and atheism. So in my 10 year old brain, I figured that the safe bet was to live according to the strictures of the Bible and deal with the defense of it when I gained access to more information. What this meant was that I would live as if I had the answer, but would keep looking for the answer as I drifted through the decades. It was not until many years later that I would identify the methodology that I had invoked as something that has been attributed to a fine gentleman from hundreds of years ago, going by the name of Blase Pascal. It is known today as Pascal's Wager. The principle of Pascal's Wager is this, I have two choices in life, but no material evidence to support either choice. One choice is to live as a God of the Bible is real and live according to his requirements. The second choice is to reject the existence of God and live accordingly. At some stage in both scenarios, I am going to die. Now, imagine that I live by the God exist option and the atheist lives by the no God option. What is the worst possible thing that can happen if I am wrong? The short answer is that neither I nor the atheist will ever know that God does not exist. Death does not resolve the question. What is the worst possible thing that can happen if I am right? Then both I and the atheist will come to know that God exists. One of us will have gained eternal life. The other one will soon be dead for eternity. In other words, to live for God is to gain everything. The alternative, sorry, I'll say that again. The alternative is to lose everything. For the Christian who believes in God, this is a sure bet. But even if you're an atheist, you cannot be certain. One thing is for sure. The win for betting on God is so huge 
it makes all other bets look like a guaranteed loss in comparison. So at the age of 10, I had decided to live as if the Bible is true and resolve the matter to my satisfaction when I had the resources to do so. Now, I'll share with you my encounters with Adventist doctrine. Apart from daily worship in the home, at the age of seven, I went to an evangelistic campaign by a pastor, Doug Weir, at Dora Creek Public Hall. He would run the program in two segments. The two, first segment was his own presentation, and the second one was always a 16 millimeter movie uh, reel of George Vanderman's presentations. This went for a number of weeks, and if we went every week, we would get a Bible. My very first Bible became a King James Bible version at the end of the campaign, and we still have that somewhere around the house. <laughs> My wife has just told me that she's using it. Uh, now, the big problem for me was not so much the interpretation of Daniel 2, but the symbols and 2,300 days. I struggled with understanding these things for decades, so much so that I think God must have withheld my understanding on that and many doctrines, many other doctrines, for reasons best known to him. At the age of 15, we went to big church camp for one of the last times that the campground was still down at Lake Araring near Newcastle, New South Wales. It was during this camp session, Des Ford came and gave a presentation at the youth tent. Unfortunately, I've forgotten what he spoke about, but I do remember the details surrounding his presentation. It felt as if the whole adult tent had come over to the youth tent to hear him speak. The number of recording devices that were stacked around the podium gave one the impression that he could have been some super important world leader. The tent itself, while fairly large, was still packed to the rafters with people wanting to hear what he had to say. Why is this important? It was in my junior years that we were going to Mullumbimby Adventist Church in North New South Wales. And in conversations being held around the church after service and between meetings, one would hear people quoting various individuals, Sister White, and with increasing frequency, Des Ford. It was quite apparent that many were listening to Des Ford and at that time had a very high opinion of him, my father included. 1979 was to be my first year at college and in the general scheme of things, my awareness of political and theological storms about to burst upon the church was zero. Shortly after arriving at the college, Desford's Pacific Union Forum tape made its way into the college and out into the general Adventist community, and my did the feathers fly. My only thought was to ring my father back then and ask him what he knew and his assessment of the situation. After all, I couldn't think of a bigger Ford fan than my dad. And so it was with some surprise that I heard him go against Ford for what he was promoting. And once again, I was in the quandary. What do I make of Des Ford? There was only one answer to that, and it came from the Bible. And it comes from the Bible in a verse that starts, by their fruits, and I'll let you complete the rest. Now, on the face of it, it seems that Des remained a solid Adventist. He was uh, defending the Sabbath. He was uh, going to church. And I was going to have to wait 20 years for a resolution to the problem that he gave me. Now, while at college, the matter of the concerned brethren, or CBs for short, came up. At this time, the most famous of them are what I would refer to as the four horsemen, George Burnside, O.K. Anderson, and the Standish twins. The students were somewhat split on how to react to these gents. I scored a poster that had been put up on the board that essentially made fun of CVs. In fact, I spent some time looking for it around here, but obviously it wasn't meant to be found for this weekend. But one thing was for sure, and that is that the CVs were scoring hits on the church hierarchy for the doctrinal direction the church was going. 
given the direction I was beginning to drift, I thought of them as being a bit out of touch. And let me elaborate. In my late teens, I developed a taste for worldly music and also bought into what I would later come to understand as new theology, also known as the doctrine of original sin. While at college, Walter Ray's book, The White Lie, came out, accusing Ellen White of rabid plagiarism. And this also sent the feathers flying. I even went to one of Walter Ray's meetings when he visited Australia. And while it was good, it did not answer one of my questions. And it is a question that remains unanswered to this very day by him or his supporters. And here is a very shortened version of the question for those who really want to know what the question is. Let's suppose, for argument's sake, that Ellen White 100% plagiarised everything that she ever wrote. Does this make the things that were written and published any less true? Now, I've got my own answer, and you probably have a pretty good idea of what it is, given that I am preaching this sermon to you this morning. But that's a subject for another time. So as you can see, I was heading fairly much down the liberal path. Contemporary Christian music began to make its way into the church. And given my tastes for the music of the 80s, was being enjoyed by me, amongst other things. Women's ordination began to raise its head. And by then, I had bought the equality doctrine that was being sold to us by the feminists of the day. But this is where I started to run into trouble. It seemed quite clear to me that the Bible was pretty much opposed to women holding positions within the church, especially from a straightforward reading of the Bible. Yet, if I were to seriously go all in on Paul's directives regarding the role of women, I would be guaranteed a good beating by the misogyny shaming stick and would also lose credibility with my peers within the church. So, into the too hard basket it went. And it was wrestling with this matter over a period of 20 years that a number of my liberal, number of my liberal progressive ideas became unstuck. Like evolution, I didn't have all the answers. The final answers to evolution matter were still 10 years away. So already I was comfortable holding on to positions that I didn't have answers for nor capable of defending. And this was just one more thing to throw into that basket. Now, during that time, I also thought it would be fun to get in debates on the side if against Adventist beliefs. But after observing two debates as a spectator, I found with disgust that not only was the solid Adventist position poorly argued, but that the opposing position appeared to be very popular with the grassroots members. And after observing that kind of outcome, I resolved that if asked to participate in any debate from that point, I would refuse if asked to be on the side opposed to the Adventist position. And strangely enough, I've never been asked to be in any kind of debate as a participant since that time. Having come to that resolution, I was still stuck with many of these problem doctrines and it took a few more years and a number of experiences to resolve some of these. It is only as I compiled this list, I realised just how big it is. It is also entirely possible that it's not complete as God brings other things to my attention. So let's, let's look at the issues I've had to face over the years. The first one was materialism. I wanted stuff, bright, shiny stuff, things that I've come to subsequently look at and think, Ew. did I really want that? The futility of chasing stuff came home to me with force about the time we bought our first flat screen TV. It took three days for the novelty of it to wear off and for me to have the Holy Spirit point out to me how fleeting our experience with stuff really is. Up until then, my attitude towards the futility of chasing stuff had been based purely upon mental assent, but the heart was not there. The second item that I had to deal with was the issue of worldly popularity. 
with worldly popularity in my young days, I especially wanted to be seen as normal. When you grow up uh, during school and the kids make fun of you for not being normal, the first thing you hanker after is to be normal. And I want to be approved by those by, of worldly origin. After all, who doesn't? But then when one begins to count the cost, we soon realize that the asking price is too high compared to what we want to achieve. And one of the other things that I stumbled across in my younger days was the matter of hedonism. Who doesn't want a good time? Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure for its own sake. Music, entertainment, women, things both legal and illegal, which produce the desired outcome, that is, pleasure. It was later on I realised what hedonism is all about. Hedonism is about the fact that without Christ, we leave, lead miserable lives. Sorrow is the default state of the unbeliever. Hedonism brings on a temporary state of joy, and yes, I said, temporary. When we are with Christ, joy is our default state. Any sorrow we experience will only be temporary. With Christ, we don't need hedonism. When the Roman Catholic Church implemented the Counter-Reformation, one of the questions they addressed was how to produce the counterfeit salvation experience. They eventually concluded that drugs were a large part of the answer. This is in part why the war on drugs will never succeed. Powerful forces in the highest of places have vested interest in keeping the supply on tap. Okay, evolution is all I've already spoken about uh, from my earlier time, so I'll move on. I did get answers in the end, but uh, they would be a question for a separate sermon. Investigative judgment. This was quite a doozy for me. Um, it was particularly troublesome. I would hear what I would refer to as highfalutin words, such as type and anti-type. And when I was listening to this, it was like I was listening to a different language entirely. I just had no comprehension. Uh, I can thank uh, Walter Byte for his presentations to start opening the scriptures to me and the Holy Spirit for its revelations. My struggle with the investigative judgment is also another sermon on its own. Okay, worship. My problems with worship revolved around the fact that my feelings were more important than my relationship with God. I believed it was the continual promptings of the Holy Spirit that slowly pushed my attitude towards worship from a desire for entertainment to real reverent worship to our King and Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I had a dream which I'll go into a bit of de detail further down the track. The next one was music. I had worldly taste in music. As a consequence, there are some music options that I cannot listen to anymore because if I do, I will feel the pull of the world. And this is a, an experience that some people who have had conversion from, from uh, the world will be able to um, uh, relate to. That there are some things that you cannot put yourself in the environment not of anymore if you want to avoid the pull that the world will exert on you. But I feel it is a price worth paying if that is what it takes to gain immortality. New theology. Now, this one got, almost got me real good. In fact, so good for a number of years, I actually argued in support of it. I used to be able to do a very effective job in arguing for new theology. To make things worse, it came from pastors I, that I respected and these passes I still respect to some degree, but they pushed me in that direction initially. In fact, 
I was really good at arguing for this position, but came to conclude after many years that I was wrong. Feminism. Can I tell you some stories about this one? I would say that it caught me completely off guard and took me finding myself in court representing my brother to finally smell the stench. On the face of it, feminism looks good until one be starts investigating it and looking at its bail consequences upon families, women and men in society to this point in time. And it was this deep dive into feminism that led me into to resolve my issues regarding women's ordination. I read a book by Wayne Grudem on biblical womanhood and it gave me a start, but then I had to continue down that rabbit hole on my own. These studies, along with new discoveries on the relationship between men and women, allowed me to see many of the events in the Bible with new eyes. Regrettably, some of my conclusions will cause great angst with a significant proportion of the Adventist population. So I'll be keeping themselves, keeping them to myself for a while and will certainly not be presenting them in a divine service for the time being. The last doctrinal struggle I had was atheism. There was at one point where I briefly considered the possibility that there was no God, and it was a serious consideration. But God was gracious enough to deal with that situation such that there was no longer any further doubt in my mind. Now, these are the most prominent of the issues I face in my spiritual walk with God. And as I think over my life, I believe that there are a number of factors that help me along the way. The first one was praying parents. My father prayed for all of us, and I believe to this day, this had a lot to do with it. I must tell you the story sometime of a Burmese girl I met in South Korea about 15 years ago, which demonstrates the importance of praying parents. Number two, extreme patience. Be slow to go along with the crowd, and you will need large helpings of patience. You may have to be prepared to wait months or even years before you finally get the answers to the questions that you have regarding positions that you hold within your faith. When I say be slow, I oh, sorry, I'll start again. Be slow to fully commit to a position where there are contradictions. You want to make sure that if you do commit, that you keep your mouth shut against the naysayers until you've fully studied the matter and can defend it for yourself. I would listen to naysayers, but would not argue with them if I knew I couldn't. But definitely do the research and see for yourself how you can defend against the position. The answers are out there. Number four, watch the lives of the naysayers and see where their positions lead them. It took me 20 years to observe Desmond Ford's position and how it changed to conclude that he was completely wrong. It is the devil's intention to deceive everybody. Looks like I managed to miss one. Okay, so this is number five. One, two, three, four. Yeah, this one's five. Yeah, no, I've skipped. I've missed one. I'll, I'll, re I'll read this one out to you because you need to know about this one. It is the devil's intention to deceive everybody. So we will all need to pray that God will spare us from the deceptions that are both in the world and are coming upon the world. I only started to pray this prayer in my 40s and it was unbelievable the number of um, experiences that I subsequently held that I can look back that are in part due to that prayer. So I would encourage everyone to pray for protection from the deceptions that are both in the world and are coming upon the world. Never in my wildest imagination as a teenager did I ever dream that homosexuality will force its way into the church as it is seen now. Yet here it and other heresies are. How much deception has been pushed into the church to get so many to go in these kinds of directions? Okay, number six. 
count the cost, and that's this uh, one that I'm on now, and consider if it's worth the price. What kind of price do you think you will pay? Some of the views that I hold now are extremely unpopular with the mainstream, both in secular society and Adventist society. I'm aware of this. I have tangled with people from the highest levels of the church on account of some of my views. If you are going to commit yourself to some beliefs and are aware by doing so, you will gain the ire of many by doing so, then you will need to be 100% confident that you are right in your belief. This is going to require much prayer and a commitment to give up what you hold dear if necessary. Do not mourn the fact that you might have been wrong in the past, but instead rejoice that God has brought you to where you are. Recently, my wife did something God found offensive and he really laid into her. Now, are two possible, there are two possible reactions, and one doesn't have to exclude the other. The first is severe shame and guilt over what was done. The second is joy and celebration that God deemed you fit to be spoken to by him in the first place. God knows us, and he knows what the outcome will be. The very fact that he is prepared to speak to you, both pleasant or unpleasant, means he knows you will listen and obey enjoy those spankings from god you will feel so much better after you have listened and obeyed value that relationship with christ above all else and everything else will eventually fall into place it was in my uh probably up until my mid 40s that my relationship with god especially Christ, was purely a mental one. And then I had a dream. And as a consequence of that dream, not only did I have a mental relationship, I also left that dream with a heart relationship. God will step in at opportune times and bring you an experience that will resolve the issues that you are facing. These experiences can be either in real life or in dreams. And that particular dream I had was one of those experiences. After that dream, I felt an intensity of love for him that exceeds the love that one may feel for their partner. That intensity has remained from that time till now and has never faded in strength. And as a fourth generation Adventist, we can all say that we have our own doctrinal struggles. As you have listened to the sermon, some of you will have thought to yourself of the struggles that you have faced as you have grown up, either in the world or in the church, and eventually came into the church or even remained in the church. We've all faced struggles. And I can say that even my own children now, as fifth generation um, Adventists, are facing spiritual struggles. Everyone has to face struggles. And I am hoping, at the, at, now that we are coming to the end of the sermon, that you all know a little bit more about me and uh, we will then go into some of these subjects in other services that I get the opportunity to um, present. May God bless you as you have listened to these words and I'd like to ask Craig if he could produce our last song for the day. All right, our last song is, today is going to be oh, Let Me Walk With Thee, My God. It comes from the This Is Red's uh, uh, channel. So thanks to that uh, channel for the use of this song. And I'll get it on screen for you shortly. <laughs> 